Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today on Insight New Mexico in the Mercury Library with an old friend and a Mercury contributor, a philosopher, a medical ethicist, Joan Gibson. Joan's going to talk to us today about uh, what she considers to be, and I suppose many other people do too, a radical form of advanced health care planning. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, uh, and particularly today, seeing as this is April 16th, which is Natural National Health Care Decision Day, a day which I'm sure probably most of us have never heard of. It's wonderful to have you here, Joan. It's good to be here, uh, and perhaps it is Natural Health Care Decision Day, but... <laughs> It is, uh, for the viewers, April 16th, which I just learned was not an accident in memory of um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, who uh, talked about death and taxes. So the founder of this grassroots movement, uh, Nathan Kotkamp, a Virginia lawyer, decided April 16th, the day after tax day, would be a great day to designate as National Health Care Decisions Day uh, to think about perhaps some things that we would rather not think about. So I know decision, uh, value-based <coughs> healthcare decision making has been around for uh, for quite a while, and you're a pioneer in this in this realm. If I, if I may use that word, um, but I'm wondering, could you explain to us what the radical nature of your idea, new idea, is? So permit me a little bit of history. Sure. Um, I was writing an article a while back that combined sort of the history of advanced care planning and end-of-life decision-making interwoven with um, our personal family story. And 1975 turned out to be um, a seminal year. Uh, it was the year that I taught my first medical ethics class at the now defunct University of Albuquerque. It's the year that I uh, got pregnant with our daughter. And in looking at pictures of that year, I, I came across a photo of my husband and me hiking in the Truchas way up high. Um, I was newly pregnant with our daughter, and around Mike's knee was an ace bandage. And I remembered coming off the mountain, he went to his physician to find out why his knee was sore. And in 1975 was when he, we received the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. 1975 was uh, quite, a, quite a year for us. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, two years later, not because of us, um, New Mexico was one of a handful of states that passed the first living will law. We called it our uh, Right to Die Act. And New Mexico has always been a leader in the area of respecting patients' rights to make their own health care decisions, including but not limited to end-of-life decisions. So, I was mm, active and involved in the, in the first uh, decade or so of living will legislation and worked on it in New Mexico. And those first documents uh, were very medically oriented. They would ask you, so Barrett, uh, you know, if you're about um, to leave this planet, would you ever want to be on a ventilator? Would you want a nasogastric tube? They would ask you very specific medical questions, ask you to imagine, were you incapacitated, terminally ill, which from my perspective are basically unimaginable states when we are young and healthy. Nevertheless, uh, those early documents were really medical directives. So in the 80s, um, some of us at UNM decided we should change the trajectory of advanced care planning. And I'll tell you what really started it, which I had forgotten about. Um, increasingly in the 80s, um, I chaired a hospital ethics committee for many years. We would have as patients incapacitated, unfriended patients, many of them homeless, people who would come into the hospital seriously ill, not able to make their own decisions, and nobody around to help the healthcare professionals treat these patients. 
So we try to figure out how can we discern what these folks would want. Now, the likelihood of a homeless person in downtown Albuquerque having had a conversation with a buddy, you know, I never want to be on a ventilator. I mean, it's not likely they would talk about those things. So what we began to do was try to figure out who are these people? What matters to them? What are the things that they hope for? What are the things that they are scared of? And it was out of that very specific project that we developed what we call the Medical Treatment Guardian Program. And it had a, a good life of its own. What we came to realize was, my gosh, that approach to advanced care planning would be much more helpful to the rest of us than trying to figure out when I'm in the hospital with my husband and he's about to go in to have a knee replacement <clears throat> and the advanced directive is asking us about all these medical treatments that we would or would not want if things went terribly wrong. It would be much more effective for us to discern and express what our goals are, what his goals are, what matters to him, so that if something happens and subsequent decisions have to be made, um, we who are the experts on what matters to us can tell the physicians, here are our goals. Now, given the situation, given what's available to you in your treatment um, briefcase, what is most likely to honor those goals? And so I think we were the first at UNM, the Institute of Public Law, to shift advanced care planning away from asking people to make very specific medical decisions and to concentrate on what their goals are, what their values are, what their wishes are. That has become, I think, over recent decades, pretty much the standard, at least starting place, for people who are talking about advanced directives. Now, uh, my proposal is, and in my little article that I entitled, What's Death Got to Do With It, uh, with apologies to Tina Turner, I think it's time for yet again a shift in focus. Um, if I ask you, uh, when you hear advanced care planning or advanced directives, what do you think of? Well, you think of death and dying and old age and um, incapacity, and these are just not comfortable conversation starters. <laughs> and so if you, you know, we older people sometimes will um, hogtie the younger folks in our family at Thanksgiving and say, okay, we are going to have the conversation. And of course, you know, their eyeballs roll in the back of their head. They really don't want to do that, not around the Thanksgiving uh, table. Um, but, but it is important that we engage people in conversations about what matters to us. I think... Number one, that expecting people to start this conversation around the topic of end-of-life care is futile. Um, I have some uh, recent uh, statistics from the National Conversation Project. 90% of the people whom they surveyed nationwide say, yeah, we really should talk about this stuff. 27% actually have. 80% say, you know, I really should talk to my doctor uh, about if I'm seriously ill, here's what really matters to me. 7% have talked to their doctor. So uh, there is a real gap in what people know they should do and what they have actually done. I think expecting people to start with that subject matter is unrealistic. Second, end-of-life decision-making reflects but a small percentage of the health care decisions that we make over our lives. And if high-quality health care decision-making is our goal at any stage of life, we don't have to start with the really tough decisions, nor probably should we. We need to recognize that there are milestones, highly predictable, almost universal in people's lives, milestones like when you get a driver's license, 
when you enter a long-term relationship, um, when you have a child. Um, there are certain situations that um, uh, it's probably uh, good for us to stop and think. If you um, take a high-risk job, if you engage in high-risk activities, you love to ski down double diamonds at Taos, if you uh, enter military training or are deployed, um, and then with your health care providers, there are a multitude of opportunities to learn how to take one's own health care values temperature around healthness, uh, health, excuse me, around health and wellness. Uh, it doesn't have to be, oh my gosh, if I uh, am diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, here's what I would or would not want. But in well patient visits with our primary care providers, uh, there are any number of times when we can um, just sort of stop and say, well, here's where I am in life. Here are some of the risks that come with these new situations or milestones and the attendant increase in responsibilities that I have because of these situations. So um, the first part of my, I don't know if it's radical, but I think it's um, an important shift. The first part of my proposal is that we separate this kind of talk from death and dying. And my hypothesis is if we grow a generation of competent healthcare decision makers, if and when they get old, they receive some kind of serious diagnosis, they will not be learning for the first time mm. how to do this. The second part uh, has to do with how do you do this? Well, the 80s and 90s were the age of autonomy on steroids, and I was part of that. Uh, and so what we would do is we would encourage people, now here's a good document that you should perhaps go look at by yourself, think about what you want, and then once you have um, a kind of filled out the list of things that would matter to you, take them to your family and talk to them about it. Well, I think what we have learned um, cognitively and about healthcare decision making generally. Rachel, uh, excuse me, uh, Naomi Rachel Remen, who is a fabulous physician, integrative medicine physician at the uh, University of California at San Francisco, she says the following Listening generously to someone else um, can help them hear the truth in themselves perhaps for the first time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sort of philosophically and culturally, I think as we move <clears throat> beyond that raw autonomy impulse of the 80s and 90s, and we realize maybe it's because so many of us are arriving at a certain age, we can't do it alone, and in fact we do it much better together. We find out that if the first thing we do is with a trusted companion, we test out what matters to us. The dialogue, the conversation, is the most important first step in any of this, not the filling out of a document which we then uh, hand to somebody else and say, go forth and decide for me. But the really important substantive part of clarifying and testing our values can be done best in dialogue with somebody else. And so what that argues for me and what my proposal is that we focus on what I call the healthcare companion piece of this and to recognize at age 16 when you get a driver's license for the first time or you enter into a long-term relationship, finding somebody in your life whom you trust and with some guides and suggestions on what to talk about that would be age and stage appropriate. Learn how to have that conversation. And if you do that 
and your healthcare companion may shift over the years. Certainly your values will shift over the years. The likelihood that your decision making when it has to really pass muster uh, is much more likely to occur if you've practiced, rehearsed, and know how to do it. So the Healthcare Companion Initiative is my sort of third shift in trajectory for healthcare decision making and advanced care planning. So it's sort of, it seems to me that <clears throat> um, if one uh, establishes a healthcare companion, what one is really doing basically is establishing a philosophical friend. And perhaps this, uh, this philosophical friend won't last all one's life. Perhaps you'll have to have many of them. But, uh, but what you're proposing really is to, is to help sort of regular people like me uh, think about the most important things all their lives, which is a philosophical pursuit. So let me ask you this. What would... Um, how, how would you convince a 16-year-old or an 18-year-old uh, that this is, that this particular exercise is, is useful and, and valid? Well, you had to go to the hardest one first, I'm didn't sorry, you? Yes, yes. Um, I'm just really, we're just beginning uh, to think in these terms. Um, part of the project is to <clears throat> spend time with people. Uh, young people in high school, uh, places where people live, work, worship. <clears throat> and one of our plans is uh, to ask, there, there, there's this wonderful group of young people uh, who are being exposed to careers in healthcare. And uh, it's over the course of a year, they're high school students, and they are learning all about different healthcare environments, careers, etc. And starting this summer, <clears throat> we're going to visit with them. And we're going to ask them anonymously as they think about their current health care status, worries, hopes, fears. What are they? Um, to begin to um, help them um, learn how to look in their healthcare values mirror. Now, some of the topics that come up over and over again are alcohol, drugs, sex. Um, they're not naive. I mean, they are not at all naive. Um, uh, many of them uh, will have experienced um, the death of a family member perhaps a friend in an automobile accident. Um, so there are any number of um, intersections with the healthcare field that young people have. <clears throat> and we're going to um, ask them um, to help us draft uh, some materials that would be trigger conversations. Ooh. I've got a local pediatrician who sees his patients up through the age of 21, sometimes beyond, and he has all their lives. It's in a small community in New Mexico. All their lives, he has been their trusted mentor. He has agreed to pilot some of these processes and materials and um, uh, give us feedback on what works, what the young people uh, suggest. Finally, even though I say, what does death have to do with it? Well, not much until it does. And my late husband um, received a kidney in 2010. And sometime later, we found out who the donor was. And the donor was a 17-year-old young man who was equipped with all the latest good equipment, helmet, etc., was shredding down the mountain on his mountain bike and ran into a tree. <gasps> and his family, his parents, mother, father, older sister, younger brother, had to make the decision about whether to donate his organs. Um, had they talked? Um, I don't know. But 
I admit that's a high profile, nonetheless, not unheard of situation. Um, as Ellen Goodman, who is the founder of the National Healthcare Project, says, it's always too soon until it's too late to start that conversation. But she also says, which I, I want to return to, because I think it really um, captures the spirit of what I want to do for the healthcare project. She says, it's not talking about what's the matter with you. It's talking about what matters to you. And that reframe into a positive, here are my healthcare goals at age 16, at age 21, when I have my first child, when I'm looking at retirement, doesn't matter along the spectrum. Being able to answer the question, what's important to me here, understanding where I am, what's going on uh, in my life. That's the capacity that, that I think we must develop early on and make it as normal and realistically hopeful as possible. And young people, um, I think in some ways, are much more comfortable in talking about these things than we older people are. As I've given talks over the years to various um, <clears throat> groups of older people, um, they're not too uncomfortable talking about their own health care values. And then we say, but have you talked about this with your kids and if something happens to them, what would they want? And, you know, I mean, silence is deafening mm -hmm. at that point to, mm -hmm. <coughs> excuse me, somehow contemplate the mortality of our children. That's tough. And even the um, illness, the sickness, sort of the less than perfect health of our children, that's a, that's a tough one. And I think young people might be able to lead the way on that. So... Here's a question. If one were to have a healthcare companion, um, many of us realize that dealing with with science and doctors and diagnoses and uh, we can treat this but not cure it is basically a death sentence, which we all dread. In point of fact, it probably isn't. Uh, if one has other resources, I'm not even sure what they might be. But how would a health, how would a healthcare companion help one deal with the kind of absolute authority that doctors exercise over your lives? The um, the training, the education um, of a healthcare companion is obviously critical. There's so many aspects <clears throat> to be considered. Um, first of all. If you've never been in a hospital before, uh, just the existential experience of being in a hospital, and especially if it's an emergency room <clears throat> or an intensive care unit, uh, I mean, that is overwhelming. The sights, the smells, the sounds. Um, of course, it is a hundredfold worse for the patient, which is another reason for having a healthcare companion. As a patient trying to navigate that complicated, um, overwhelming environment when you're sick, when you're injured, even if you can speak for yourself, <clears throat> it's uh, too much to ask. I mean, at some point, you got to be able to be the patient. So, what that means is then that the healthcare companion. Uh, would benefit from some exposure to what's going on. So, for example, um, if you know you're going in, you've been snowboarding in Taos, and you blow out your knee, and you're going in for some orthopedic surgery, most of the time there are pre-op meetings. Bring your healthcare companion to the pre-op meetings. Um, at least expose them for the first time to what it's like. Um, and it might be that we even can develop some programs in healthcare institutions themselves that um, introduce people just to the environment, what to expect, etc. <clears throat> Second, how to communicate, let's say, with physicians. Well, you know, today's healthcare environment puts incredible stresses 
on physicians, even if they're not dealing with end-of-life decision-making, it is a rushed, compacted situation. My advice is the best people with whom to speak if you're in the hospital are the bedside nurses. The bedside nurses, maybe even a social worker, but they're the ones who come in and visit you regularly. They're the ones who will have more time to stop and listen. And you can bring your healthcare companion along and be part of that conversation. And they are the conduits then for that information getting back to the physicians. So practically speaking, I think that is one of the best ways for you and your healthcare companion to navigate uh, this situation. But if we begin to think of... Um, planning for healthcare decisions as something we don't do by ourselves in the privacy of our own minds, but that somehow um, brings in this other person, even if it's after the fact, even if it's, you know, I went to the doctor today and here's what we talked about. I think realizing that the relational aspect of healthcare decision making needs to be our default position, not something that just happens accidentally. Oh, by the way, Joan, thank you. This was wonderful. I'm th this this half hour just went like that. I've got a ton more questions, but perhaps we can talk about it later on next year or or at the end of the year. I love this idea. I think it's really useful and and it's so positive and hopeful. Thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. So find your healthcare companion, have that conversation, and be well.